starting with the rough samples I collected, I'm going to cut these into a slab, and then I'll cut that slab into a little rectangular billet. Whenever you're cutting rocks with a tile saw, you're going to want eye protection and ear protection, such as headphones. And the first step will be to turn the water on and then the saw. If you haven't cut rocks before, uh, the main thing to keep in mind is just to go relatively slow. You just don't want to really push the rocks through it. Uh, just let it abrade because it's really just a thin strip of sandpaper basically. Uh, only it's diamonds embedded in brass. So you really want to just let the saw take it. So here's the slab. Ultimately, the speed in which you cut is going to depend on the size of the rock and the hardness of the minerals in the rock. And then ultimately, we'll end up with this little rectangular bit. It's always good, if you can, to have a rectangular billet without rough edges, uh, and you'll aim for these dimensions uh, for the standard 47 by or 27 by 46 millimeter slides. And then I like to stack my billets on the rocks, and then keep everything labeled as you go through. The side opposite of the label will be the glue side, so we'll want to uh, then lap that surface, which is the next step. Moving on to lapping the billet, the glue side we want to be as flat as possible, so uh, I'm going to try to get rid of any grooves left by the blades. So this wheel has some sort of textured surface to it, probably about 240 grit equivalent, but I'll use the loose grits in conjunction with that, uh, either the 400 or 240 on this. The nice thing about this wheel is you can vary the speed on it, but you don't want to go too fast or the, the rock will just sort of skate on top. So I'll demonstrate the speed that you want to set these at if you have the option. This is about how I like to have these to have an effective abrasion. Once you've ground the surface, make sure there's no blade marks or tapered off corners like this one has in the, in the near corner. What I'm demonstrating here is I like to keep my metal plates honed flat for the thin sections. So what I'll do is take two plates and a 400 or 240 grit slurry and sort of grind them against each other. Uh, this one really didn't need much so you can see that I struggle with it a little bit but I'll do this before or after each batch of thin sections and I feel like it's pretty effective So back to the 400 grit on the uh, metal plate I'm using, so I'm going to lap, uh, continue lapping these billets. Same grit as before, um, but I'm just doing this by hand now. Side to side motions to keep this flat. You don't want to use circular motions a lot of the time with any grinding or polishing uh, because it tends to round the corners off. Moving on to the lapping film, you'll want to back these with a couple of pieces of paper. Uh, this is an aluminum oxide sandpaper with uh, plastic instead of paper, I guess. Uh, you can find this on Amazon. And what I'm doing is giving it a quick polish so that I can look at the reflection to assess if it's actually flat and without blade marks. Uh, the second one, for example, that lower left corner has an issue, so it needs to uh, repeat the process 
of lapping it flat. And before I move on, I'll put some foil on a hot plate. All this is optional, but I like to heat cure my epoxy and just to speed things up and thin it out. So I'll put one sheet on and then a second sheet because I'm actually going to pre-glue these, which is a, an optional step. I'm going to lay them down in some epoxy on this, which will cure for a half hour. Before I do that, I need to uh, clean these after they've been lapped flat and given a quick polish on the 9 micron lapping film. The polish is really just to evaluate the, the surface at this stage um, because any grooves and blade marks will show up very uh, prominently. And then I'll lay these down on a hot plate to dry just to speed things up. And once those are dried, I'll actually rotate them to continue drying just so vapor doesn't get trapped in somewhere. And I use this uh, West System epoxy. It's a slow cure epoxy, so you have plenty of working time. And these are really hot, so I will take them off the hot plate. The resin to hardener ratio is five to one on these, but on the pump style ones, all you have to do is use one pump of each and it'll automatically be measured out. Uh, these ones are brand new though, so I have to pump the nozzles up first so that I can get one full pump of each. And once that's there, I will do one full pump of the resin. And then do the same with the hardener. Then mixing the epoxy, this is kind of crucial too. You don't want to really whip in a bunch of air into it needlessly. I'm sort of carefully doing figure eight motions and just folding it together until there's no streaks. Uh, so this will take a few minutes to do, but you want it to be nice and clear and it'll also kind of thin out a little bit. So this is what it looks like once it's all folded in nicely. The stir stick is not really leaving any streaks. And you can use the heat as well, but you have to be careful not to overheat the epoxy or it'll just start volatilizing. So this is the pre-gluing step, which is a good idea with porous samples or friable samples. First I'm just painting some on the, the glue side surface, but I'm actually going to flip these over onto a puddle of epoxy here. I'm just doing this because I believe that it you're less likely to trap a bubble in a crack if you do this, so... And yeah, some thin section companies will always do this, um, but you don't necessarily have to do this every time. It's really just if your sample's not very fresh or solid, like I said, porous samples, friable, stuff with clays, your schists, you know, with micas, water gets in the crack, you, you don't want any of that. And this will help. And that'll cure for 30 minutes, and while I'm waiting, I'm going to just clean up some slides because they're pretty nasty. And after 30 minutes, I will peel the, epoxy, or the foil off. And this is a lot easier if it's totally solidified, but some of the edges weren't. But the parts near the billets were totally cured, so I just peeled it off. And just tap on it, 
Make sure that it's solid. It shouldn't be rubbery if you mix the epoxy correctly. Then I'll trim these up and uh, trim them close to the billets and throw away the little epoxy bits. And I'll leave the surface, the glue surface epoxy on for now, but we need to grind down uh, the edges of the billet. I want to grind down the edges of the billet to the rock, uh, because it's not a good idea to leave already solidified epoxy on the edges of the sample. For some reason I found that it it may cause a hairline fracture in the glass when you're slabbing them for whatever reason. So now the edges are all trimmed up and ground down of epoxy. So now I'm going to just bisect the rock part on the glue surface and I'm not even going to turn the wheel on for this because it doesn't take much. So this is almost bisected except that top part has some epoxy still on it. After a little bit more work I've bisected the rock and the epoxy is filling in some of the cracks of the rock and the pore space. Moving back to the flat plate, I'm going to use some 15 micron aluminum oxide. This will give it a nice matte finish and it'll be a good intermediate step before the lapping fill. Back to the lapping film, we're going to give these a quick polish on the glue side. That way they end up being sort of double polish sections, which gives a nice optical appearance for these polish sections. Here I'm just cleaning them. I'm heating up some water in this kettle. And dish soap. This is a really good way of cleaning your billets. And then I'll rinse them off in the sink and then dry them again on the hot plate after patting them dry. So I've got gloves on now because this is the crucial gluing stage. I'm just blowing off any lint on the slides that I've already cleaned. Again, one pump of uh, this epoxy, or the uh, resin, one pump of the hardener. making sure it's a full pump. Again, mixing that up. And then once that's mixed up, I'm going to paint the surface here. Then I'm going to take a slide, I'm going to uh, roll it across and sort of work the bubbles out. Normally I lay it down a little bit more gentle, but it doesn't really matter as long as you're... Uh, the key here is not to really push too hard. Um, if you push on it, once you release it, it'll draw in air from the rock, or draw out air and leave a sort of a dendritic pattern of air. So you really just want to gently push down so it's in contact with the rock and work out any air bubbles. And then I'm going to cure this on that hot plate uh, upside down. So I'm going to grab, grab the bottoms of these billets, which I didn't film, but uh, take it over the hot plate face down using the weight of the, the uh, rock. Here you can take a flashlight and look for bubbles if you want. That one looks really good. And here they are face down curing again for a half hour on this uh, hot plate. 
and I've sort of situated old billets so that they don't slide it around. If any epoxy dripped over the side and under the glass slide, you can just scrape that off with a razor blade pretty easily. For the epoxy on the side though, you got to be a little bit careful because you can chip the glass pretty easily. Here I'm just trying to get under it and take it off as one piece. So looking at these, this is the worst one. It had a little air bubble here. It's a really weathered sample. Um, sometimes this will happen, but this won't cause problems here. So this is the Hillquist thin section machine I use. Uh, rotating this on the left, uh, that way moves the right part left. <laughs> and then for the slabbing part, there's a little screw that if you tighten it, it will push against a piece of metal moving the arm outward to the left there. But if it's already set right, you never really have to do it again. Um, but it requires some trial and error. But as with the, the uh, tile saw, I'll turn the water on here. And before turning on the machine, I'll make sure the arms pass, just um, which they should because I always leave it the same. Uh, wipe off any grit um, that may be on the arm. Then I'm going to put the slide. This one, you have to hold it. Uh, this is a pretty bare bones thin section machine. But I like it. Cut a little bit and make sure that it's leaving plenty of rock on still. It's not digging into the slide or something. And this will leave a good millimeter or two of rock on. Uh, probably about a millimeter. And then halfway through, check it to make sure it's not digging into the rock on the uh, slide side and then I uh, will uh, zoom in to show the the end part so you just have to watch your fingernails you know from being abraded I'm just gonna hold on and it'll sort of break off nothing too crazy once it breaks off you can even leave that little bit of rock on there still you can take that off with the other wheel uh, this is another diamond wheel, I think, actually, embedded in brass. I don't think it's carborundum. But this one you have to clamp the slide in. It's spring-loaded, which is good, so it'll sort of give. Uh, but you want to make sure that the slide is well secured in this brass. Now you even like to hold down on the slide But you'll sort of inch forward and back uh, on this. It'll leave a nice ridge and it should leave the thin section still on there. I have it set to where it's probably leaving about 80 to 100 microns of rock. Inch forward, keeping some friction. You don't want it dragging or anything. That's why I'm sort of pulling back every uh, half second. And then once you're all the way across the slide, you can use a longer motions, but be relatively quick. You just don't want the rock dragging on the wheel because it could fracture minerals. At its setting, leaving 80 microns, it probably wouldn't, but any thinner it might. This is what the sample looks like after the thin section machine. I don't go very far with the thin section machine because it could, again, fractured minerals. I then use this wheel after I get it to 80 to 100 microns on that machine. For a quartz rich sample I'll go to about second order green on this wheel. Um, I probably won't even rotate it for softer samples like talc bearing rocks or whatever. But this does a lot of the uh, rough work before moving on to just doing the rest of this by hand.
I didn't spend too much time on this on this one. And again, after this, you can see that there's some second order greens in this, and those are the highest interference colors that you see. Uh, those being where the c-axis is in the plane so that the uh, retardation colors are greatest. For an ultramafic rock on the other hand you might have higher order colors just because you have a lot of olivine or something. Uh, this one has mostly serpentine in it though and even those olivine rich ones might have serpentine so so you can aim for first order colors for the serpentine in those samples. So again, back to the flat plate with the 400 grit. I'm going to start doing these by hand. Again, side to side motions, up and down. Less of the circular motions. I'm only doing that to spread the uh, grit out. You will uh, check it to make sure you're not forming a wedge, which you likely will uh, form a little wedge. This one's probably too fine grain to evaluate with just polarizing film, so we'll look at it under the microscope. Uh, this end has some second order greens for quartz right up there at the top. And as I move the sample to the other edge, you'll notice that the order of colors goes down to this sort of purple, purple blue. That is a 80 to 60 micron taper. So we'll try to even that out by putting more pressure on the thicker edge. So side to side. And now you can see that the highest interference colors are just that uh, purple for all the quartz in the sample. And it's pretty even overall throughout. And at this stage, I like to approach 30 microns with the uh, 15 micron aluminum oxide. Of course, make it a nice consistency for the slurry. Take a look at it on the microscope to see if there's any parts you need to press down harder on to sort of even things out if you need. And you'll pretty much do this until you get quartz with a slight pale yellow tinge to it. Uh, that is the maximum retardation that you want quartz to exhibit when it's at 30 microns. Next I like to trim off the excess ep epoxy around the edges just so that grit doesn't get embedded. Then you'll just label the sample using one of these little Dremel tools. And you could have labeled these at an earlier stage on the back side of the slide. That is also an option. It's really good to do if you're doing a lot of samples that you can't keep track of the labels or rock types. Here I'm using the lapping film first, which will give a nice flat polish. Make sure there's paper backing it. When going down in grit, you want your side to side motion to be 90 degrees to the previous grit that you used. So now I'm moving up and down on the 3 micron. And now onto the diamond paste, which will give it a lot better polish than the lapping film. The lapping film gives sort of a flat polish, whereas this will round out the grains a little bit more and give a better appearance. And again, I'm going to do the same crisscross pattern I used before. I'm going to uh, use side-to-side -side motions in one orientation and then in 90 degrees from the previous. So this one I'm going to braid in the long direction. Now I'm going to wipe it off and I'm going to show you what it looks like on reflected light to see the uh, scratch marks that it leaves and we're going to progress down in grit from here. So horizontally here you can see the scratch marks. They're oriented with the long axis of the slide as I'm indicating here. So on the next finest diamond paste 
I'm going to use the opposite orientation going up and down on the short uh, axis of the slide. So now the scratch marks are straight up and down for the same orientation of the slide. There's those diagonal lines which are I think are just a cleavage or exsolution texture of whatever opaque mineral this is. These metals or opaque minerals are best for showing this because they're soft enough to leave those scratches and they reflect more light. So if I show you the finished product you'll now see that that opaque mineral is now pretty smooth looking and overall this thin section looks really good. Realistically I just uh, spend a minute on each of those uh, diamond paste grits and but do it in this crisscrossing pattern without really evaluating the polish on reflected light or anything and it ends up with a really nice result. I'm sure micropro microprobe quality this is a nice thin section with some biotite garnet, hornblende, quartz schist. And that's pretty much the process.